Good evening, everyone who joined us by way of um, the internet. We are live, but we're going to give about two more minutes before we get started. If you have any prayer requests, you can put it in the comment section, and we will be opening up with prayer at about 7.05. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for Bible study tonight.
Amen. We're going to start our Bible study tonight, and we're excited to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I dislike having to use a microphone at Bible study since it's only a few of us. I truly, truly dislike it. But in order to have a good sound quality for those who join us by way of the internet, I do have to use it. Uh, and I pray, I pray. Let me try to pull it up on my phone so I can see what y'all saying out there, if y'all are with us. But, but I pray that we are... Um, we are uh, coming in good and strong. I checked the sound Saturday. I checked it again today. And it appeared to be in, as my granddad said, good work in order. Does it say we're live? Let me see. Yep. So now. See if I can pull it up and hear it. Testing. All right. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? All right. So those of you who are joining us by way of the internet, we're thankful for you. Those who are in the sanctuary, if you have a prayer request, we actually put it in the prayer uh, in the comment section, and we're going to pray right now. Okay, Deacon Shah said, you're coming in strong, Deacon, Deacon Anthony Shah said, so we're glad to have that. So we're going to open up with a word of prayer. Might we pray, our Father and our God, we're thankful and grateful and honored to be in your presence tonight, God. God, we know some of your servants have had a long day and they had to fight through many things just to arrive in the sanctuary or to join us by way of the internet. We know that the enemy is ever present, ever busy. He hates for us to study you and to know your word, God, because when we know your word, your word then changes us so that we will become more and more like you. And the worst thing for the enemy is for the believer ever to be able to understand all that you promised us and to stand on the promises of God and to not be wayward and not walk away from it, but to build our faith. And God, we pray right now as we study your word tonight, God, that you would, your word would take root in our hearts, that it would grow up in us, that it would build our faith, build our hope, build our love, God, and we will walk upright before you and before man, that men, women, boys, and girls might glorify you and you alone, for you are worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we began this study, this study, Mere Christianity, um, we discovered, we discovered that, um, the word mere, I had to go, I got to go back and, and clarify this because, um, one of the, the, the young lady who, um, uh, wanted to accept Jesus Christ last week by way of the internet, she said, uh, why do y'all call, why, do, why did he call this book mere Christianity? Um, she is from the Northwest region. Oregon State or Washington State, one of them. And she said she just happened to find her because she was looking for Macedonia in her town. And it brought our Macedonia up. And she watched for about three weeks and then wanted to accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And uh, we were talking back and forth through Facebook Messenger. And she said, I was watching your rebroadcast of your Bible study. And in my estimation, the word mere means it's something small or insignificant. So why does C.S. Lewis call it mere Christianity? And I said, you know what? It might be some other members that feel that way. Because sometimes we think about something that say mere, that means little. But what mere Christianity means is not little. He just means these are the basics. These, these are the foundational truths of which we're building on. He, in the beginning, C.S. Lewis reminded us that I didn't come to you as a biblical scholar or theologian. He told you at the beginning, I'm not a very high person in the church, and I'm not a very low person in the church. I am the typical believer who's trying to come to an understanding of who God is and what God requires of me so that I can then become a disciple and tell others what God, who God is and what he requires of them. So when we look at it, I told you at the beginning that studying this book was twofold. Number one, it was to make sure we all had a biblical 
a basic biblical understanding of God's truth. But then number two, it was to equip us to be apologetics or to defend the faith. Because what happens so oftentimes, especially with our young people, um, is people of other faiths come up and they try to trip us up with the word and try to twist the word and try to tell us what God said, but he didn't say. And because some of us don't have a strong enough understanding of what the word of God is, when Jehovah's Witness come to your house and they pull out your Bible and they show you in your Bible some things that are not necessarily in context, it makes you then doubt who God is. And then they'll tell you, now you come on over to the kingdom hall so you can learn some more. Now, if you tell them to come down to Macedonia, guess what they're going to tell you? I can't go to Macedonia. But they want you to come to the kingdom hall. Even when you have family members who are going to be buried, they'll tell you to come to their memorial services at the kingdom hall. But you got a funeral in the church, and they'll drive up and sit in the car. And we want to make sure that we're prepared, not just for Jehovah's Witnesses, because um, right over there on um, Martin Luther King, on the bypass, right past what's going to soon be the old East Side High and um, Fickwit is the Church of Latter-day Saints. Now, when I was a child, my granddaddy called them the Mormons. He said, here come the Mormons because they rode their bicycles with them white shirts and black tie up and down the street. Now they have changed and say they're the Church of Latter-day Saints. And when they come to you, they come with the Bible first. And then they say, but you know, God didn't stop speaking. So let me pull out the Book of Mormon. And most Christians sit there and let them read from the Book of Mormon and not tell them, hold it, shoot, stop, buddy. No, 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 no. Revelation say don't add nothing to it. He said what he had to say. He gave Joseph Smith a whole nother Bible. And you're not finna sit here and try to uh, say that Joseph Smith was just as great a man as Jesus Christ. Because Joseph Smith ain't died for, for you, and he sure ain't rose for you because he's still dead. And as a matter of fact, you go back and look at a lot of Joseph Smith teaching, he did not care for people who were of other ethnicities because in his eyesight, God died for those who were of the Caucasian persuasion. And so when we look at this mere Christianity, we're looking at it to root out anything that is not biblical and to reaffirm and to establish that which is biblical. So when we have a dialogue with people and we're trying to witness to people, then we can cut across the fat, cut across the field and cut across the fat and tell them, listen, we're not gonna get caught up in all this minutia and the things that have separated us in the body of Christ for years. We're going to deal with the things that unite us and the truth of the Bible. Because right now, one of the biggest black eyes the, the Christian church has ever had is the fact that we have all of these different denominations. And the first thing somebody outside the body of Christ say is, how can y'all tell us that we should be united and saved in Jesus Christ and y'all can't even agree on what you should believe? And you have to tell them, there are differences in denominations, but the truths that we share from mere Christianity are the truths that are universal to all Christian churches, okay? So he started out, and we talked about last week, that he started off and he backed himself into Christianity because he started the conversation as an agnostic, as a, uh, someone who was simply seeking. Now, somebody said, well, why did he start off as an atheist? Well, atheists believe there is what? No God. So when you come to atheism, that means they don't believe in the higher power at all agnostics believe that there is no way this could be all that it is if there was no God. But I don't know which God is God. So he starts the conversation by saying, we know that something or someone intelligently designed the world. And in knowing that someone or something intelligently designed the world, who is or what is this someone or something? And he backs up into saying that the only one who ever presented such a case to say that he was God and that he could be trusted to be God was the one that died. And the only one to this day that got up. 
All right. Now, Buddha, he lived. Buddha, he taught. Buddha, he died. Buddha still is. Confucius, he lived. Confucius, he taught. Confucius, he died. Confucius still is. We got our brothers and sisters in the Nation of Islam who want to tell you, come on over to the Nation of Islam. Um, come on over there because that's where everybody going to be. And you tell them, well, the honorable, as they call it, Elijah Muhammad, who started the Nation of Islam, the, the, the uh, Americanized uh, version of Islam, the Black Power and Black Empowerment Movement. Uh, well, you know where he was born, don't you? Elijah Muhammad, y'all know he was born? Santa Vida, Santa Vida, Jordan. Okay. Right, right down the street. <laughs> in, in Clay Country, in, down there by the Kaolin Mines, okay? Elijah Muhammad, right down there. And he lived, and he taught, and get what happened to Elijah Muhammad? He died. And get what? He still did. Louis Farrakhan took up where he left off. And he teaching and he doing all that. But guess what Louis Farrakhan going to do? He going to die. And as Christians, we don't put anybody up as this great master teacher who God solely speaks to and through and nobody else can hear it. That's not biblical. So when we look at it, we find ourselves last week, um, we talked about two different things, Christian marriage and forgiveness. Um, and last week we weren't able to stream, so I have to give a little context on Christian marriage and forgiveness. And when we talked about Christian marriage, C.S. Lewis said, I'm not going to delve too much into that. And why did he not delve too much into that? Because he said, I'm not what? I'm not married. So I'm not getting into the uh, inner workings of marriage. I'm just looking at it from a biblical standpoint alone. Now, C.S. Lewis did get married later in life, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, and to his credit and to his testimony, he got married to a young lady who at that time, I can't remember the, the disease, but whatever the disease was, when they got married, she was only given six months to live. And they prayed and God miraculously healed her without the intervention of doctors. And she lived seven more years and they were married seven years um, when she finally passed away. But when they got married, it was to say she was at the, at the end, but God gave her seven, I think it was the seven years or more that they lived married. But when he looks at Christian marriage, he looks at it from, two, from twofold, the same way we look at it, from the physical and from the spiritual, okay? Now, from the physical is two individuals, a man and a woman. That's the Bible. Okay, now, America, Great Britain, Canada, Istanbul, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Indistan, you won't, can say same sex can get married. They can say it all the time. But what the world says and what God says is two totally different standards. And what C.S. Lewis says is as believers, we spend too much time trying to tell the world how to do right when if we spent that time making sure we were right, then the world would see us and say, well, if they're doing it, why not join them doing it? But the problem comes in in the physical when the world sees no different in the Christian marriage and the secular marriage. We talked last week about right here in the Metro Atlanta area, where you have pastors and bishops and what they call apostles swapping wives. I told y'all my former pastor, my, my current pastor, the pastor of my former church, is in a building right now because when everything came out, the pastor thought. The new pastor thought that the former pastor was his dad and the new pastor was his uncle. His daddy brother, the worship pastor, was actually his daddy. But his mama was his mama. 
Because in Jesus' name, they said, God set the bed under fire, so we all just get in here and do what we do. And then we say, but the world making Christian marriage look bad. The world can never make Christian marriage look bad. The only people who can bring a black eye to the church is the church. And C.S. Lewis said, from a physical standpoint, we've got to make sure that we are upright. Don't make no sense that the pastor sent him with a sweetheart and a wife. And you'll be surprised how many churches have, uh, have, have sat and let pastors do it. Everybody in the church know. Sitting there looking at first lady saying, <laughs> she don't know that baby in the quiet, that girl in the quiet thing, pretty by red. He get around. Never forget a pastor in the city. He was single, single. Got married, had to have security at the wedding. And then one crazy woman showed up with a white wedding dress on. They said, what you doing? He married me. This ain't your wedding. It got to be. He was just at my house last week. Well, well. And then they got audacity to say that the world making Christian marriage. No, 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 no. See, Lewis said, y'all spending too much time talking about the world when the standard is right here in the house. And if we kept the standard, the world can't do us no harm. He said, but now that from the physical standpoint of making sure that what we're doing is showing the world the right way, he says, not only that, but the spiritual aspect of marriage. When it says you leave and you cleave and the two become one flesh, then y'all need to be one. Right now in America, we have way too freely to go to get hitched on Friday get divorced on Sunday, and we get hitched again on Friday to somebody else. As if there's no standard of saying, if I'm marrying somebody, I'm marrying for the long haul, okay? So he said that spiritual aspect of, we talked about last week, that there, the spiritual aspect of it, and I gotta get into Jack's lesson, but the good news is we only have one chapter, chapter eight, and it's a pretty good chapter, but I can teach through it and give me 17 minutes. But uh, Christian marriage, Christian marriage, he says, when you look at it, that it is a spiritual connection. Because in the view of the church, it's still two people up there. But in God's eyesight, the two have become one. And people say, Pastor, I don't want that how he do that. You don't have to. Just like we don't understand how you can go down in that tap wall and come back up and you're a brand new creation. We don't understand how you can take juice and bread, any juice and bread, and you can take it and it connects you to Jesus Christ and his atoning death on the cross. And people say, well, the, the bread and the water the bread and the juice, we pray over it. I said, okay, so when you get married, do Reb not pray? Same different. Nothing spiritual has ever happened without a dialogue with the divine called prayer. And prayer is what changes what we see from what we see to what God sees and what God does. And so he says, Christian marriage. Then he gets to this thing called forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. One of the four cardinal sins, cardinal, cardinal virtues, forgiveness. And he sums it up on this wise. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Don't add nothing to it. Don't take nothing away from it. Now, I know we sit here and try to justify it and say, well, pastor, I love him, but I don't like him. But if the love you have for them can't get past your dislike for them, then you don't have love for them. If you can see them struggling and it bring you a little joy to see them struggling, that ain't love. Because love never rejoices in somebody else's turmoil, somebody else's down setting. I have to tell students all the time when they get excited that somebody may have failed a test. I said, what do them failing the test got to do with anything to do with you? 
You know, she walk around here all cocky like she knew everything and she don't know it. I said, and guess what? Her average gonna be her average and your average gonna be your average. And guess what? You done fail every test. So her failing one ain't gonna have that great impact on her average, but look like you might be sitting right here next semester. But it do feel good to know she failed. I said, but you still in the same shape. What joy do you really get out of somebody else's misery? And we have to check ourselves because forgiveness says that when I forgive you, I take the pain of the poison that you caused me and you no longer, it no longer have any impact on me. But unforgiveness, as you heard, is like drinking poison and hoping the other person gets sick. Here you are drinking them. Now I'm waiting for them to die. But, but you the one that drunk the poison. You, you the one can't live your life. You see them and wonder, how in the world they just keep going and doing, and, and they know what they did to me. They might know it, they might not know it, but guess what? They have, they, their forgiveness of you and their moving on has nothing to do with whether you forgive them and you move on. And you've got to make sure, without a shadow of a doubt, that you uh, practice true forgiveness. Practice true forgiveness. So tonight, we move to chapter eight of book three, chapter eight of book three, and we talk about the great sin, the great sin. Now, how many of y'all read, read the chapter? It's okay. Uh, he says, the Christian faith can be based on the abhorrence of pride. He says, the greatest sin, the greatest vice is pride. Lord have mercy. He said, pride. He said, y'all got caught up with, because I started with sexual immorality. You thought that, that I was going to harp on that and that was going to be the big thing. He said, but the truth of the matter is most of the sexual immorality deal with the fact that you have unbridled pride. He said, almost all sin comes down to man thinking that the ultimate goal of life is to please oneself. So when your whole life is lived for the simple pleasures that you have, you have entered into a state of perpetual pride. And pride itself is an affront to God. We remember what was the sin that caused Satan to be kicked out of heaven. Pride. He thought that I am such a good worship leader, such a good worshiper, that instead of worshiping God, y'all ought to be worshiping me. Whenever you turn and start practicing the gospel of me, you in for a world of trouble. So what is this pride thing? We gotta be careful. He said there are three facts about it, three facts. Hardly anyone will ever admit this flaw in them. He said, that's why we gotta be careful with pride because we love to say other people are pride. Other people are arrogant, but we very rarely wanna turn the mirror on ourselves and say, I might have some arrogant ways. I might have some prideful ways. See, as Lewis says on this, on this, that when one person has it, they truly detest it in others. Because you walk around and say, I dare they had audacity to think they just good at me. But don't even realize that you thinking that they think they just as good as you mean that you have what you say you don't want them to have. He says one of those things where oftentimes in the subconscious, well, he doesn't say in the subconscious, but the way he defines it, in the subconscious, that you walk around thinking so highly of yourself that you forget that this life is not about what we can take up, but it's about what we give up. And we see that even in God, from the very beginning, God could have simply made the heavens and angels worship him and said, that's it. I ain't gonna make no man. Why would I make somebody that could go out and do what I told them not to do? 
If he was, God was truly prideful, he would have never made man and gave us free will. But even in giving us free will, guess what he turned around and did? Humbled himself and sacrificed himself so that we can have repentance of our sin. So the basis of God is the an antecedent of pride. That God wasn't too conceited. He wasn't so conceited that he said, I'll let man die. But he was so concerned with us that he said, if they need a savior, I guess I'll save them myself. And here we are trying to say we want to be like him, but walk around with our nose to the air, looking down on others, thinking we're better than others. And when we talk about pride, we're just not talking about pride because of the money you have or pride because of where you live, but it could be pride in any shape, form, or fashion that allows you to think that you could possibly look down on any other person. Number two, he says, on the other hand, it bothers us the most seeing it in others. It, get, it really rubs you wrong. You know when you were back in the day, you party, you shut the, you shut the party down. You had to fly a suit in the house. You know they were having that uh, party, parliament party, and you had went and got you that psychedelic suit. And you said you're going to be the only one that looked like that. And you showed up and everybody had the same idea and went and got some tin foil and wrapped around their clothes. And you said, I dare everybody else to look good as me. He said, that's what it is. It, you detest it most when you see it in other people. And if you do, then that might mean that you're proud. Then number three, he says, in fact, the more we have, the more we resent it in other people. Right now, they have what they call the Battle of the Billionaires. I don't know how many of y'all been paying attention. Have y'all been paying attention to the Battle of the Billionaires? Okay. These folks got so much money, they won't go to space. So you got Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin with a space rocket. You got Elon Musk and SpaceX with a space rocket, with a, with a space shuttle. Okay. Now, they, they, they put their money in it, but they'll tell you this. The government and pay for 90% of all the stuff that they're doing because they decided not to fund NASA anymore, so they're funding them. But, but that's a whole nother story because that's how the rich keep getting richer and you got to go buy your gas, but the government get them money to buy their gas. But anyway, and now you got Elon Musk who, for whatever reason, didn't have a lot of people that liked him. Now he want to buy Twitter. And, uh, you know, I teach business. I used to teach business. So, of course, we sit down and talk about business all the time with students and stuff. And one of the students made, made a wonderful observation. They said, Mr. Brown, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do to get people to like you? I said, I don't know. He said, whatever Elon Musk doing, he get buying Twitter just so people can like him. I said, I don't believe that. Then the young man started showing me the tweets and stuff. And he said, and you know who got the most followers on Twitter? I said, I have no idea. He said, Barack Obama. And he can't stand it. <laughs> I said, but how, how, many, how, how, how many times does Barack tweet? I said, because I have Twitter, but I don't, I don't look at it. He said, every blue moon. I said, but must tweet five, six times an hour. And he still can't get no more friends. And so he decided to buy the whole thing just so he could have more friends. I said, I don't think that's the truth. But the more I start looking at it, I realized that that pride that make you want to be the richest man in the world, now you got to find something else to do. And I tell everybody, to be a politician, and I mean, even to be a pastor, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie, to be a pastor, you have to have some sense of narcissism to say that I should lead a whole group of people. Like when, when pastors come in here and say, oh, I never desired to do this. Well, Joker, you wouldn't show up to no interview. You wouldn't never wrote no resume. Like, let's be real. Now, I truly try to be one of the most humble pastors I know because I know this ain't my show. Never have been, never will be. 
And we know on the other spectrum of it is pastors who will tell you in a heartbeat, this is my church, this is my deacon, this is my, 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 my. And you say, the church we have for you got here, real? how did it be yours? But you got to have a certain level. But when you think about those who have pride, you can never fulfill or satisfy pride. Because every time you think you have gotten enough, you want what? More and more and more. And nine times out of 10, you're not going to make wise decisions in getting that more. You're going to be led simply by your lust for more things. So the question of pride, the question of pride, why is pride destructive? Why is pride destructive? The center of Christian morality, pride or self-conceit. When you get to a place where you think that the world revolves around you, you will then begin to think that God will accept you any way you come because it's about you and not him. That's why right now you got preachers and pastors and churches sitting up there talking about that I can be a man and marry another man and God going to honor this and that our church going to uh, celebrate same-sex marriage because now the gospel is not about God, but it's about you. And pride literally says, I change it from G-O-D to Y-O-U. It's not about him. And we have to be careful because even in some of the preaching, when we hear in some of the teaching, when people put more emphasis on their personality and who they are versus who God is and what God requires and what God's standard is. And anytime we try to equate God's movement to what we decide to do, we enter into rocky territory where our pride gets in the way. I never forget um, early off in ministry in my hometown, most churches was either buying new churches or building new churches. And every pastor got up and said the same thing. God gave me a vision and we got to move. It, it could be five folks in the church. Five folk. Church about to fall apart. They ain't took care of it. But now we got to move just because I want to be able to say I moved the church during my team. Or I built the new church during my team. We had one church that had a building probably might size or might be a little bigger than us, a little bigger than this building. And they went and built the building. They were about the size of that road right down. Just so they had something new. First service, first Sunday they were out there. They had chairs in the parking lot with the speaker because they couldn't get in. Just because they wanted the baby say, they built something new. And they said, well, what was the problem? I said, because the pastor had turned it over and it was no longer for the glory of God, for the glory of the congregation, but it was all about what you're going to write in the history book about me. And churches try to be kind in the history book. They don't say the pastor left us in the dead. <laughs> they don't say the pastor almost broke the church. But whenever you recognize that what you're doing is not for the glory of God, but for you to get some accolades, we enter into pride. And that's why pride is so destructive. See, as Lewis says, the source of all vices and sin is pride. Now, how do we think that happened? I just told you, right? Whenever you put yourself in the place of God, you can justify almost anything when you say that God's desire is for me to be happy and pleasure. You can talk yourself in almost anything. But pride tell you that God is more concerned with me enjoying life than me giving him glory. So you could justify almost anything. Just think about it. If I'm, if I say God is more concerned with me being happy, then I go to the buffet every day and eat to my heart content. And when my blood pressure goes up, I can rebuke the devil. Take a blood pressure pill, take some headache medicine, and all of that. 
but I'm gluttonous, but I'm justifying it by saying that God said he put this cow and this pig and this stuff here so that I might live. Because you put it on you. And the picture that C.S. Lewis paints is that if we're not careful as believers, we can easily move into a place where the gospel is no longer God-centered, but me-centered. And when you get off-center, you start justifying stuff and start trying to rationalize stuff and, and saying, it's okay for me to cuss folks out because at the end of the day, God got angry and Jesus turned over tables in the temple. But wait now. He said, you'll know you're my disciple by the love you have one another. Was that in love that you cussed them out and gave them a piece of your mind? Well, Greg, you don't understand. Sometimes you just got to do. I, I'm asking you according to the word. Well, I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit lived in me and he ain't told me, he ain't convicted me on what I did. I said, you sure the Holy Spirit convicted you? Because more than likely, it's like Romans chapter 10. When he said, and you going around to establish your own righteousness, have not, have not submitted to the righteousness of God because you've allowed pride to come in and now pride will be able to justify almost anything. Right now, we see Putin over there in Russia going to kill them folks in Ukraine. All because he won't power. Unbridled, unfettered power. And people sit back today saying, I don't know how that man could do that. I don't know how that man could do that. I said, this ain't the first time. Did you not pay attention to world history? with Alexander the Great and um, Genghis Khan and all those who went and conquered, murdered and killed people, brought them into their captivity. The very people who uh, oftentimes we celebrate and oh, look at the Roman Empire, look at the British Empire. Do you know how they became empires? By killing innocent folks, taking them as prisoners, all for their power, and all so that they could say they were in charge. I said, and we ain't got to go all the way back to the BC era. We can come right down here to back to 1960s in the United States when people were just saying, take your feet off our neck and give us the right to vote. And they were still throwing bombs on folk porches because they had the audacity to go and try to register the vote. And you say, Pastor, how is that? Because in their mind, God was the God of the white man. He wasn't the God of the black man. So it didn't really matter what I do to him because in my eyes, they're less than human. So I can justify my sin because God don't care about it. We ain't got to go to Ukraine. We ain't got to go all the way over there. We see this guy right up there in Buffalo, New York, just this past week, driving three hours dressed in tactical gear, go in and kill 10 people. And we ain't got to get on that color because we know they were all black. He came to the neighborhood because they were black. But then you walk out without a scratch, they ain't knock you outside the head, they ain't did nothing. You walking out the store like you happy go lucky. And here it is, George Floyd, Tamir Rice, all of these uh, black that had no weapon and they didn't walk away. And you say, what is that? That's because when they get on these police forces, they are, some of them allow pride to get in them to think that they are the be all, the end all, the judge, jury, and executioner. And that pride come in and they have no regard for the life in front of them. And people are going to say, well, you anti-police. Hey, anti-police. I got a lot of friends that are in law enforcement. But you know what they tell you before they go out there? They pray the Lord that you protect me and that you give me wisdom when dealing with everybody. That pride come in and pride will lead to destruction. Got to be careful. So the great sin. So how do we get over pride? How do we get over pride? He, uh, Paul, uh, C.S. Lewis this morning, he says pride always call, creates enmity. Enmity. What does enmity mean? Separation. 
separation. He says pride is a spiritual cancer, a spiritual cancer. What is cancer? And what is what what is the, what 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 makes cancer cancer? It takes a normal cell and mutates it into a bad cell, and then it multiplies over and over and over again. And that bad cell multiplies faster than the good cells, and then it starts taking over the good cells. So he said that how pride is. If you let a little pride come in. All the good you do is going to be swallowed up because that cancer is going to keep growing and growing and growing. And even though you may have started doing the right thing for the right reason, but because you let pride come in, now you got to make sure your rep don't call my name for bringing them baked beans, son. I ain't cooking no more baked beans. I'm tired of him not calling my name, but that's what it does. It takes the focus off of doing what's right because it's right to not doing it all because you want your name called. He says what it looks like. He says other vices work through our animal nature. Pride comes directly from hell. He said pride was derived from the devil. Now other nature, other vices, other sins, gluttony, we see animals out there now that will just eat their heart content and lay out what they do. When it comes to sexual immorality, we see it all the time where certain people just can't control it. So you got to lock them up. He said, but pride is nothing, not, nowhere in the other forms of life that somebody will take so much pride so much self-adulation that they would set themselves up to be out of the, the, the fold or out of the, the, the flock. Even when it come to lions and two male lions got to fight for who gonna be the head. Once the one that wins is the head, the one that lost don't have enough pride to say, let me leave and go out here and die. No, let me sit my tail down so I can live. But pride says, I'm, I'm feeling being hurt. I'm gonna go start my own church. He said, but that pride comes straight from hell. It's at a place where you can never be corrected, you can never be challenged, and you'll never change. He says, and sometimes it can even be used as an appeal to quench other vices. So he talks about the, the fact that two men could possibly want the same woman. Okay, and then those two men want the same woman, they might have discord with one another because of who she chooses. He said, but pride says that I want her because he has her. And the only reason I want her is because he has her. And once I have her, I no longer want her because I just wanted her because he had her. So in the long run, it's nothing natural about it. It's all unnatural and it leads to destruction everywhere you look everywhere you go. That's why even in the church, you got to be very, very careful. That's why the Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly. Some folk get a little tighter. Lord, they get crazy. I mean, it goes pew, straight to the head. And then you sit in church and you say, listen, we are all brothers and sisters. Hey, you don't understand the degree I got. I got more sense in my pinky finger than everybody in the church and their whole body. And you say, they didn't gain no wisdom. Because you can have all the books sets in the world and still can't use it to get yourself out of wet paper sack. Yeah. The third thing Lewis says, this is like trading a cold for cancer. Yeah. So many times people say, well, if I can get rid of gluttony, I'll be all right. He said, but if you trade gluttony for pride, he said, yeah, you might have got rid of gluttony, but in the end, once pride builds itself up, you're going to be a gluttonous, you're going to be uh, a liar, you're going to be a trickster, you're going to add all that stuff in there. He said, don't ever think that allowing pride to take root, that it's going to help you eliminate other stuff. And what happened is, in the early 20th century, is people said that uh, pride 
or being proud meant that you would get rid of the other stuff because then you didn't want people to know that you had those other things. And like C.S. Lewis said, just because it looks like in the public I have overcome these other things. If deep down on the inside, the only reason I've overcome it is because I am simply concerned about how people think of me. And that's the only motive behind it. He says, you've entered into a whole nother category because now you're more concerned with what people think than what God thinks. And just because you might do your dirt behind closed doors, don't mean that dirt is less dirty than it was when the dirt you were doing from the dirt from the beginning. And that's what pride does. Pride makes us, gives us a false sense of security in saying that I'm better than my neighbor. But in being better than your neighbor, are you being what God calls you to be? All right? So what is the big idea? What is the big idea? We're out of here. We're out of here. Overcoming pride. How do we overcome pride? There's Lewis said, pleasure at being praised is not pride. Okay? So when you do something well and somebody congratulates you, that, that in and of itself is not pride. And there's nothing wrong with, with accepting praise for doing something good. Number two, he said, genuine admiration is earned. That is earned is not pride. So uh, when you congratulate your child for doing well in school, that's not pride. When you've done the best you can and pastors say, we thank the culinary team for how they help carry out family friend day, that's not pride. So don't get it twisted to think that you just got to walk around and take a, a, a vow of humility like nuns and say, nobody can ever recognize me for the work I do. No, if it's been earned, that's fine. But number three, he said, God doesn't want, doesn't, God doesn't want us to, doesn't, God doesn't want to rid us pride for his sake, but ours. God doesn't want to rid us of pride for his sake, but ours. Because what happens if you think that the only reason God wants me not to be proud is because he's prideful, then you got it twisted. Because if God was simply prideful, I would love to say God is a jealous God. He is a jealous God, but he's not prideful. Because if he were prideful, he would have never made a creation that could go against what he said do. Because he could have made us and not given us free will. He could have made us just like the angels. And anytime he snapped his finger, all we got to do, holy, holy, holy. All the angels can do is sing. That's why the old folks say that we have a song that angels cannot sing. Redeem. Angels can't sing that. He said, so when we look at him getting us over pride, it's not because he is prideful, but it's because it puts us in proper perspective to say that no matter how high I get, I still got to look up to God. When you get to a place where you're prideful, you begin to think that God's desire is to please you and your desire is no longer to please God. And we got to be very, very careful because we, this postmodern gospel preaching is slipping into a lot of that. I mean, a lot of that. Like this gimmick in, I'm going to give God $1,000 and he going to bless me with a mansion because I'm planting a $1,000 seed and I gave it a $1,000 seed and God better bless me. And you say, boo-boo, I ain't going to say the next two words, but um, you can't make God do anything for you. And if you thought, thought, giving him a little bit of money was going to make him move, then you better go try to play Georgia Lottery. Because this is not what God mandated. He said, give whatever you purpose in your heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Then we got a lot of them telling you, you got to pray the right prayer and pray the right time, and run right three times, all that stuff. And you say, Wait a minute, that's manipulation. That ain't faith. If God can only move because I can pray three times at a certain hour and say the certain word, that, I told y'all several times, that witchcraft. You go and get a spell book telling you what to do, how to do it, what words you say. Hocus Pocus and Kalamazoo. But that's not God. 
And when people say, well, Pastor, I don't know if that's biblical. Read through the text, the book. The book never tells us what we should pray when we're praying for the sick. It says, if there be any sick among you, let them call on the elders. And the prayer of faith shall hear the sick. And then you say, well, I just don't, I don't know if God operate if we don't have faith. Now, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. But we also know this. He said he sent the rain on the just as well as the unjust. So it's folks in the hospital right now who don't even know Jesus Christ who are going to be healed from cancer. And it's folks who know Jesus Christ who are going to be healed from cancer. It's folks who know Jesus Christ who are going to die with cancer. It's folks who don't know him that's going to die from cancer. That does not negate the fact that God is God and he's going to do what he going to do whether or not we pray and have faith because our pride says let me move out of the way and let me let God be God but when you have that pride you come in there saying that I command and I stand in authority and I do this and you say after you get through it all of that God said now you know what I'm God I always have been always will be and I am the author and the finisher of your faith. You can pray in faith till you're blue in the face. And there are many times I say that y'all Baptist folks take the power out of the prayer when you say, nevertheless, let that will be done. But you know, we realize it doesn't matter how much we pray, no matter how much we give, the, the fact that God does what he does help us to remove the pride that we have in ourselves and we don't have to push nobody up. We ain't got to pump nobody up. That's why we ain't running out here to bring the sick to no special preacher, to get no handkerchiefs and no holy oil and saying, if I could just make it to this certain preacher to lay hands on me, I know God going to heal me. No, the Bible says the prayer of faith. It doesn't matter if it was big mama or it don't matter if it was a three-year-old, as long as they got faith and pray, pride says you got to find the right person and that's got to be me. But faith says I've got to talk to the right person. Doesn't matter who it is talking as long as they have faith. And see, as Lewis said, pride, you don't get rid of pride because of God. You get rid of pride because of you. And the third, fourth thing he says, true humility, humility is not self-deprivation, dep depreciation. It is interest in others more than self. So he says, what happens? And we got to be careful. And he doesn't want to. He's, he's very careful when he gets to this and in the next chapter on charity because many people saw his book as an accusatory view on Catholics and how their priests and their nuns have to take a vow of poverty. And it's such humility that everything they have is, is belongs to the church and they don't have any clothes and no cars and they live in a convent and all that. And he said, no, 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 no. God never said that. He never required you to do all that. You can still be blessed. You don't have to depray, deprive yourself of any good thing that God has given you. But at the end of the day, don't think that anything God has given you makes you better than anybody else. He said there are two extremes. Some of y'all over here trying to say, I can never have anything, can never do anything, because if I do, then I'm going to be prideful. He said, no, that's not, that's not pride. That don't mean, it don't mean you got to go give everything you got and get to the poor and live on the bridge just to say you don't have pride. No. He said, but when you do get the things you get, remember that God commands that out of what he's blessed us with that we bless others. And that what we have never, ever, ever makes us better than anyone else. And I told y'all, I preach it several times, and I try to preach it everywhere I go. There's no way one piece of dirt, one pile of dirt can think itself any better than another pile of dirt. Because at the end of the day, they've been king. Been queen, there have been bishops, and there have been popes. There have been great leaders, and the poor are the poor. But at the end of the day, life's common denominator has caught up with each and every one of us. And the scripture says, From dust we have come, 
and thus we shall return. If you ever want to know why you can't be prideful, it's because at the end of the day, all that you get up in this world, you got to give up when you take that last breath. So it don't make no sense to think, because I got this that I'm betting somebody. People worry about Walt Disney right now. Walt Disney World and Ron DeSantis and all that stuff. I tell them, well, if y'all ever know Ron, uh, Walt Disney, he was a little crazy. He done went and got his head froze. Because said one day man going to find out how to bring man back to life. Did y'all know that? Yeah. He froze his head, hoping that when, when, one day when they finally find a way to bring brand, man back to life, they're going to bring him back to life. I said, nobody told him, you coming back, buddy. But it's when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel. He going to put one, land, one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. Gabriel going to blow the horn. The dead in Christ shall rise first. The sea going to give up her dead. The land going to give up her dead. And that head going to have to connect to the body wherever it is. It might be frozen, but it's going to connect. And then this mortal must put on immortality. This corrupt woman must have put on incorruption. And then will come to saying that death is swallowed up in victory. And you say, well, pastor, ain't a reason to be prideful, is it? Sure ain't. Because at the end of the day, each one of us got a reservation that we're going to have to keep. Now, I know we've made reservations in the past to go places. And sometimes we make it and sometimes we don't. But we got a reservation we're going to keep. But the Bible says the point on every man wants to die be in the judgment. We can't be prideful because we got to get up out of here. Soon and very soon. And so C.S. Lewis said, I want to cut across the rug because I want to cut across the fabric because at the end of the day, too many times we look at the sins of the flesh and we want to make them the big sins. He said, but none of them are possible without the sin of pride to think that you can do what you do and that God will be okay with you doing what you do. He said that there's only one standard, only one standard. And that's the standard God put in place. Any questions? Next week, oh, I forgot to change it. We're going to cover, um, well, actually, next week we're covering 9, 10, 11, and 12. 9, 10, 11, and 12. I know y'all say, ooh, how are we going to get through all that? Very carefully. <laughs> No, 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 no. I, oh, I told, oh, I told a fear. No, 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 no. We do not have Bible study next Tuesday. <laughs> we do not. Um, we have Senior Honors Night next Tuesday. The Tuesday after that, which is the Tuesday after Memorial Day, y'all know I normally cancel after holiday, but because I won't be able to be here next week, we will come the Tuesday after Memorial Day, and we're going to cover 9, 10, 11, and 12. 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, the not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after. So if I don't, if I don't, if I don't say that Sunday, please somebody say, Pastor, we ain't got no Bible study Tuesday. Make sure I remind people. Um, we have underclassmen honor night on Monday and senior honor night on Tuesday. And we well, got to be there. Our graduation is not to next, not this Saturday, but the next Saturday uh, at 9 a.m. Yes, I don't know how we end up a whole week behind. Look like everybody. Yeah, because the east side tomorrow, right? Yeah, because your nephew graduated tomorrow. Don't you? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I don't know how. We, I don't know how it happened. But we we always finish school the weekend of Memorial Day. But it just seemed like this shit was long. Oh, I just pray next shit we. Whew. Um, but y'all be y'all be careful, be on the lookout because uh, COVID and the flu, COVID and the flu, 
really, really high, really, really high. Um, my daughter's school, they, they've had uh, a rough go with it in all the grades. And the hospital is having a rough go with it. And um, especially if you get both. I have a friend, the same age, got both and then ended up two weeks ago, got diagnosed with both. And then yesterday, he texted and said they had to put him in the hospital. I got double pneumonia. And I told him, I said, you can't keep walking around doing it. He said, well, I ain't going to get him for a couple of days in the hospital because I got to go back to work. I said, well, that's fine. He said, what you mean? I said, let me go and call your wife and tell her if she needs somebody to preach you, I will be happy to do it. Don't tell me that no more being sick. I said, if you don't sit there and get well, you're going to make her right here. I said, this ain't double pneumonia you didn't play with, man. I said, this COVID and the food, this is nothing to play with. I know y'all, you listen to certain people telling you this just a little cold, this just didn't up. I said, but you said yourself, you could, you barely had energy to get up out the bed and go to the bathroom. Now, if you that week and you 38 years old, that week, and you normally working 12, 14 hours a day, what they tell you? Sit your tail down. And grandma used to say, why the Lord do his business? Sometimes when he can't get you standing up, he got to lay you flat on your back. And when he texts me and I called him, I said, well, maybe this is a good time to study the word of God. And uh, I'm going to send you some scriptures and some books and anything you need to know. And uh, uh, he texted today. He said he had a question because he was supposed to be a John today. <laughs> I know y'all said, that. your friends are crazy. You, you have crazy friends. But um, most of them just have me as a biblical resource anyway. Because I'm just talk to me because it's so draining after all day of talking. Um, but most of them just, uh, we're friends because we can be real with one another because I can't be real with you, can't be no friend. And then number two, because they say, well, you just know the word, don't you? I say, I don't know the word, but I know the word. Because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as long as I know him, then he'll teach me all things. Same thing I tell them. Uh, they say, uh, people always say, I know you read all the Bible. I said, I have a couple times now, all the way through. I was going to do it this year, but I didn't. But next year, 2023, is the Jordan year. Y'all know that. <laughs> the Jordan year. But as a church, we're going to read through the whole Bible in a year, like we tried to do in 2020. But we're going to read through the whole Bible in a year. Um, but I tell them, even when you read the whole Bible, you still don't know it all. I said, even right now, when I get ready to study for Sunday morning, I said, God, I didn't see that in the text. Like I'm studying three different texts for Sunday. I don't know which one I'm going to use yet, but gosh, all three of them, I said, Lord, you show, showing some fresh revelation. I said, I wish this Sunday had seven months, seven weeks, and I could preach all of them. But here I am, ain't got but five. We'll bring it back in. Uh, I will say June, I'm just going to, I'm going to preach whatever the Lord say fit. But in July, in August, we got a great series on the sound of music. The sound of music. It's going to be really interesting, too, because uh, I know sometimes people don't realize that with music comes emotions. And with emotions, they create thoughts. And with thoughts, they create action. And that's why the Bible says that Satan is the prince of the air. And what they always say? across the music, come across the airway. So we're going to talk about that and deal with that. And then we're going to look at some songs and some lyrics and some thoughts and some actions. And, and even as our own community, we're going to look at why we are the only people, the only people that have music that glorify the degradation and destruction of our own community. In the United States, we're the only people that glorify the destruction of our own community. We're the only ones that celebrate and promote music that tears down our women. No other genre of music, no other group of people would support music that tears down the backbone of their community except us. How do we get to that place? How do we get there? So we're going to talk about that in July and August. But go ahead and get started thinking about it and talk to your young people and ask them, just ask them some questions. I want, I want to talk to, because I'm real, like I tell people, 
I didn't realize until I started thinking about this series. But you know, I don't listen to hip. I don't listen to a lot of hip hop. Um, so I started listening, and I mean, this stuff is just grotesque. It is disgusting. And to think that they would promote this and play this and celebrate this, and especially the young women, how do you play something that calls you everything? How do you do that? Like, I said, whoa. And I, I said, and people are gonna say, ain't no way he won't listen to that. I can promise, I don't know what it is. Cause even my daughter said tell you, if it was written past probably 1996, 97, well now, cause um, 99, 2000, about 2000, we really don't listen to it. And if it ain't gospel or if it ain't old school R&B, we really don't listen to it. And um, it's rough. Even when my family comes to the house and they say, you can't play nothing newer. I say, you better check my playlist. <laughs> Everything I listen to got a meaning, <laughs> okay? But we're gonna talk about that. But uh, neither here nor there, let's, let's get ready to, oh goodness, 815, let's get out of here. Huh? Y'all should have told me at 850, 750, y'all should say time next week. We got the next, not next week. All right. Do we have any prayer requests? Uh huh. And that poke and Therma Banks. Okay. We'll be praying. Okay, we're going to be praying. Rosemary family. Amen. Thomas family. Chris Thomas. And, um, Brother Henry Howard, they bury his brother Sunday. So I want to keep him, his family, our prayers. Okay. Okay, last Saturday. So we want to keep all those in the prayer. Those who join us by way of the internet, thank you, Pastor, for the word. Oh, amen. Um, I don't see any prayer requests on here. So God bless all y'all for joining us. I know it's been a long night. We're not going to be this long no more because y'all know I got to drive a whole hour home. <laughs> but uh, we thank you. Thank God for each and every one of you. And might we pray. Our Father, God, we thank you for your word tonight, God. We thank you that you have come against all pride and that we should walk in humility before your God. We thank you, God, that our lives should be pleasing to you, that your desire is not to please to simply please us, but God, let our walk, let our talk, let our dedication, let our devotion, let it all be pleasing in your sight. God, we pray for divine healing right now for all those on our prayer list, God. For we pray right now for Sister Bridget as she goes in for tests, oh God. We pray for Brother uh, Christopher uh, Bargy, God, that you would heal right now, God, in Jesus' name. Oh, God, we pray for the Thomas family, God. We uh, pray for the Price family, God. We pray for the Roseberry family, God. We uh, pray for Brother Howard's family, God. We know that in our time of grief and sorrow, that you are very present help, oh, God, that you're able to heal, you're able to uh, restore God. You're able to comfort and you're able to keep us, God. Oh, God, we stand right now in all of all your richest blessings, God, that you continue to restore upon us. God, we pray that you would steal the cold, clammy hand of death. Oh, God, we pray that you would send your healing virtue to flow, God. We pray, God, that you would bind our communities together, God, that no more innocent blood be shed due to hatred and envy and strife, God. 
We pray you wrap your loving arms around those people in Buffalo, God. God, we know that a crazy, sick person went in a church in California, God. Oh, God, we know that they were shooting there in Texas on Sunday, too, God. God, we know the enemy has desired to just wreak havoc and cause fear and, and anxiety all over the land, God. But we know you're God of peace. And we decree and declare and command that Satan will take his hands off of, of people, God. And God, that you would send those uh, people in, God, to stop these attacks before they ever happen. Give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding to see these homegrown terrorists and to stop them before they carry out these senseless acts, God. God, we pray that you would bless those 10 families, God. Let none of them go lacking, God. That you would give them peace, God. And for the men and women that will have to stand and give words of eulogy, God, we pray for divine strength and divine power for them, God. Comfort right now, God. God, we look over those in Ukraine and those all over the world who are fighting for their lives. We pray, God, that you would bless them and comfort them and keep them. God, as we prepare for our children to finish another year of school, we pray they finish it successfully, God. And then throughout these summer months, God, that you shield and protect and keep them from all hurt, harm, and danger. God, bless them indeed, God. God, don't allow them to go lacking for anything, God, but bless the hand of their parents and their loved ones and all those that will take care of them, that they will be able to provide for them and they will uh, be able to buy the food and all the necessary things for them. And God, we even command right now that this inflation return to the pits of hell from whence it come. The gas prices, food prices, everything needs to come down now. Come against the greed of these businesses that want to exploit and do harm to everyday people, God. God, we know that you're able to prick the heart of the king, for the king's heart is in your hand, and you turn it whichever way you please, God. We pray right now, God, that you would bless us uh, going out and not coming in, God. And God, as we depart from this place, we pray you've never been addicted from your presence, but keep us forever in your care is our most sincere prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.